We'll read this before the special comes. Philippians chapter number 1, verse number 18. We'll just read verse 18 through 21. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Paul says, whether people are trying to punish me or not, whether they're preaching Christ because they love Christ or they're just trying to punish me, I'm happy either way that Jesus is being preached. I'm happy either way that Jesus is being preached. Happy. He goes, I rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. And he's not talking there about spiritual salvation. He's talking about deliverance. He's talking about an actual deliverance. He says, I'm going to be delivered out of this jail because y'all praying for me. All right. How many believe prayer still works? Amen. Amen. He says, y'all praying for me, all right? And he says, uh, knowing uh, uh, the one preached Christ of contention and all these things, he goes up there, but he says in verse 19, through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so, uh, now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Paul said, hey, listen, as long as Christ gets the glory, he's magnified. People see less of me and more of him. Whatever it takes, I'm happy with that. What an attitude. What an incredible attitude. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What's Paul saying? He says, my life is dominated by Jesus. It's all about him. I want everything that I've got going on. I want Christ to be magnified. My brothers and sisters, if we spend this life... Allowing Christ, by the way, it is an allowance. Paul could have not submitted to this trial. He could have rebelled against it, but he submitted to it. If we spend our lives allowing Christ to be magnified through our lives, the ups and the downs, you have spent your life well. In fact, I'll say this, you haven't spent your life, you have invested it. A life dominated by Jesus, what does it look like? We'll continue here this morning. Father, thank you so much for the testimony of Paul. I'm not there yet. Father, I don't think I am where I, I still complain about little things. I don't look things through the lens of this helps the gospel get out. Or as long as you're being magnified, Lord, I, I still have my flesh so present with me. Lord, what a struggle it is for every one of us in this room. Father, I pray that you'd help us today see again what it looks like for a life that is dominated by Jesus Christ. Father, help us to have the testimony of Paul that to live is Christ. There's nothing better than that. The next best thing is to go to heaven. Father, help us not to spend our time wishing we were in heaven and doing nothing on earth. Help us to live for Christ. And Father, there will come a time when we die or when you call us up. Either way, that's going to be a blessed day. But until then, help us to pursue you. Father, help us to win Christ. Help our lives to be absolutely dominated by Jesus so that Jesus is magnified in us. Help us get a little closer to that today. We'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in God's presence. Good morning. Thank God for that. See, y'all need to hang on to that this week. Amen. Amen. You need to hang on to that song. Now, that song, I like the song because it's steeped in a biblical truth. Yeah. That God's in control and He's made no mistakes. People will. They'll make a ton of them. And you're going to be affected by that. But God makes no mistakes. Trust Him. It's better than the alternative. So much better than the whole alternative. We, we just read in Philippians chapter number 1, really what this whole Bible, or, or this whole chapter, or this whole book of Philippians is all about. And it's this, it's rejoicing in the Lord. And, and uh, the reason that Paul is able to rejoice again from jail, locked up, uh, he's able to rejoice in the Lord because his life is all about living for Jesus. Whatever it takes, whatever, whatever uh, uh, it takes for the Lord Jesus to be magnified in his life, whatever path he leads him on, uh, Paul says, I'm okay with that because I, whatever, whatever is in me, whatever is in me, I want God to get all, all of me out of me and I, and I want the Lord to use me so that he can be magnified in my life. And that song just went with that beautifully this morning and I thank the Lord for that. Paul basically said this, if I die, that's good, that's the... Next best thing for me, and by the way, I'll just stop here for a minute. This is not about your best life now, all right? I know, and I'm not here. You, maybe you read the book, and maybe it was on the radio this morning or on your, in your CD player as you drove over here, all right? Your best life now. This is not our best life now. 
This is not about how good it can be for us down here. Our best life is waiting for us in Jesus' face, all right? I mean, being in God's presence, that's the, next, that's the next best thing. So you're saying, what's the next big thing you're looking for? The next big thing I'm looking for is seeing Jesus face to face, all right? That's the best thing that could happen to me from this point forward. I'm saved and I know that I am safe, secure, and sure. Praise the Lord for that. I've got a wife who loves me. I've got children who like me. I, I mean, I, 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 I've got, listen, I've got, I've got a, a church who tolerates me. I mean, I, I, I'm a blessed man, and so I'm not looking for the next big thing and whatever blessing I can get in this life. God has blessed me far beyond comparison, beyond anything I deserve right now. My next best thing, and I'm waiting for heaven, that's what Paul said. Hey, listen, the only way it could get better for me, Paul said, the only way it could ever get better for me is actually see Jesus face to face. But the best thing that I can do, if that's not the case, is to live for Him. Paul said that if I can't see Jesus face to face, then the next best thing for me is to live for Him with everything that I've got. For to me, to live is Christ. And so Paul speaks to these Philippians who loved him so much. He speaks to these, these Christians who are uh, so worried about him and, and so concerned about him. He writes them an encouraging letter from jail. Not, hey, listen, he didn't ask for a letter to, from him. Say, Lord, oh, help me out here. He says, I'm in jail. I'm writing you a letter. I'm going to encourage you. Now, by the way, let's hope we never have to have that ministry. Amen? Some of you have had it in the past. Praise the Lord for that, all right? Don't be, hey, I'm being honest here. Some of you got some past on you. Praise God for that. Let God use it for his glory. Amen? Let God use it for his glory. Don't get all worried about it, all right? Let God use it for his glory. Whatever story you got, let God use it. That's where Paul is, all right? And, and so, Paul said, listen, I'm locked up here. I'm going, to, I'm going to encourage y'all through the Lord. That's in the Greek, y'all. He said, I'm going to encourage y'all in the Lord here. I want you to know that, listen, when your life is dominated by the Lord Jesus, you can just be happy wherever you are. Amen. Why? Because we're, we got the Lord Jesus. Nobody can take, nobody can, people can take your houses and your lands. They can even take your life, but they can't take you from Jesus. We saw several weeks ago that the Christ-dominated life is revealed in a genuine love for people. You genuinely love people. Then we saw that the Christ-dominated life is revealed in an absolute commitment to the gospel. We already read this about Paul. Paul said, I, I don't care what happens. As long as Christ is magnified, Christ is preached. He said, there's some guys out there trying to cause trouble, and they've got it for the wrong motives, but, the, but their message is fake to them, but it's, the rest message is real. Uh, he said, I'm glad. By the way, those of you who have been hurt by a preacher, been hurt by a ministry... You need to understand something, that even if they hurt you, if they preach the truth, it was still the truth. Live on the truth, not on the personality. Somebody say amen right there. We've all been hurt. We've all been hurt. Paul gives us a great example. He says, look, there's some guys out there preaching the gospel for the wrong reasons, but I'm glad it's being preached. So just let's, let's let God handle all of it. Would you say amen with me right there? Just let God handle all of that. And then he said, uh, we looked last week that a Christ-dominated life is a, is a life that has an absolute concern for testimony. Your testimony. Every one of you have a testimony this morning. Your testimony is not what God has done for you. Your testimony is what your life says about the God you serve. We often view testimony as, hey, the Lord has done this for me, and by the way, give God praise when He does something for you. Amen. Amen. Give, give God the praise and the glory for that. But really, your life, your testimony is this. It's all about revealing the God that you serve. God has redeemed unto us Himself a peculiar people that we should show forth what? The marvelous praises of Him. right? That we should, It's all about Him, not what God has done for us. And so that's what your testimony is about. And Paul said in Philippians 1.27 that you need to let your conversation, your lifestyle, be as becometh the gospel of the Lord. And he says your life needs to paint a picture of what it means to be saved by grace. Let me ask you something. When somebody looks at your portrait of your life, what picture does it paint? I it was recently somewhere at this, uh, I went through this, walked through this fancy hotel this week, and they had these uh, uh, fancy paintings by uh, a toothpaste guy, Rembrandt, uh, uh, and, and Monette, uh, and all these other fancy paintings, right? And everybody's looking at them, and they're this and that. And I'm thinking, you know what? My four year old does stuff like this. <laughs> this, is, this is not art. This is, you know, it's that and whatever like that. I, I could do that. All right? I'm colorblind and I could do the, some of those things there. I wasn't impressed very much with what I was looking at. And there's people standing there saying, oh, and just you see the mood and all. And they're thinking, what are you seeing? What do you see in this picture? I mean, it, it's a, like a waterfall and a, 
what is this? You know, some of you like the finer things in life. I like, I like the painting that's by the numbers, you know. You color it or whatever like that. Cause it tells, well, listen, I looked at this and I thought, wow, I just don't really get anything out of this portrait. I don't get anything out of this picture. I'm looking at this and I am not impressed. I have no earthly idea why anybody would pay more than $5 for this thing. I wouldn't pay $5 for the frame. I'm looking at it and thinking the picture is not worth that much to me. But your life is a portrait. It is a picture of what God can do with the sinner. Thank the Lord for that. That's why if you've got a past, thank the Lord for it. Amen. Everybody has a past. Thank the Lord for it. Don't be ashamed that your testimony is not as bad as somebody else's. Don't be ashamed that your testimony is not as good as somebody else's. Don't be ashamed of any of that. Wherever, you're, wherever you are, wherever you've been, wherever God has brought you to, it is a testimony of what God can do with old sinners. Somebody say amen right there. That's your life. That's what your testimony is about. And, and uh, this letter's theme is joy no matter what. I mean, it's joy, and that's Paul's testimony in this. Paul's testimony throughout the whole letter is joy, joy, joy. And we saw that in Romans chapter 14, joy is a big deal to the Lord. The Bible says that part of the kingdom of God is righteousness and, and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, meaning this, that one of the avenues that God works through, one of the ways that God displays His power, His strength, His sovereignty, His ability through your life is through the joy that He has given you. Isn't that amazing? Think about this for a minute. Paul's locked up in jail and he's happy. What do you think his, his accusers are thinking? That didn't work. Yes? Y'all catch me on this one? Think about what as Paul, as Paul said in the writing about joy, his accusers, the worst thing they could do was lock him up. And they thought, if we, can't, if we can't kill him, we'll lock him up. And Paul says, lock me up. I'm happy about it. Oh, you want to kill me? Good, that's game. What can you do with a guy who's not afraid to die? Yeah. Paul's testimony of joy was all about the sovereignty of God. It was all about, hey, it doesn't matter what you do to me because everything is a win. In my Paul's funeral many years ago, one of, his, uh, one of the church members there sang a song, I'm a winner either way. And, and I can't won't sing all of it. I wish I could. All right, But it, it, was, it was a song, a testimony of somebody who was ill, and it said, I'm a winner either way, whether I go or whether I stay. All right, Because I'll soon have my healing whichever way. I'll, I'll be having my healing down below or up in heaven where I go. But either way, I'm a winner. I love that song. I sing it all the time. I make up the words as I go, but I love it. Here's what Paul was saying. Listen, he said, I am joyful. This is my testimony of joy because God is in absolute control of my life. It doesn't matter what you do to me or what others do to me or what Satan tries to do to me. You can't take God from me, and if you take me from this earth, you're just sending me straight to Him. What are you going to do about it? Years ago, a preacher was preaching on something, and, and uh, John Arise, I don't exactly remember the issue was, but somebody came up and pointed a gun at him. He said, don't you preach that anymore. And he said, you can't threaten me with heaven. <laughs> really? You can't threaten me with heaven? What are you going to do? And so Paul's testimony here is this. I, I've got joy in the Lord and, and God can do anything. And Paul said in chapter 2, verse 15, don't ruin your testimony by complaining. Last Sunday morning, I preached about complaining. And, and, and as it was great, as people were walking out the door, I was asking, how are you doing today? Can't complain. No, you can't complain. No, I'm serious. You, you can't complain. You can't complain because it puts God in a bad light. Paul said, listen, do all things without murmurings and disputings. He says, don't complain about what is going on in your life. Not saying that it's A-OK. -okay, not saying that you're fine with it. Not saying that you love it, that you even want it. But don't complain about it because it puts God in a bad light. He says, you've got to, your light, you're walking as a light in the Gentiles amongst the world and you've got to show forth the word of life. And you can't hold forth the word of life while you have a complaining spirit. Somebody say amen. amen. And so, by the way, let me, God has given you, he said, well, I, I've got all these burdens in my life. What am I supposed to do with them? There's a difference between crying out and complaining. The Bible says you can cry out unto the Lord. Amen. Say amen with me on this one this morning, church. All right, I got to do a I got to do a life check here. I got to do a life check. If if you're if you're a man in your life, say amen. amen. If you're a woman in your life, say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, that's all we got too. That's only two choices. All right, all right, amen. All right, we're alive. All right, we're alive this morning. So Paul says, listen. You've got to have a testimony. You've got to have a conversation that becometh the gospel. And if you complain about what God is doing through your life, you're saying God doesn't know what He's doing. He's not in control. He doesn't know the path that you take. Paul said, don't complain. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. It is much easier to complain than it is to pray. Much easier to complain than to pray. 
As I was speaking to a dear brother this morning, complaining doesn't change anything except your spirit. It gives you a bad one. But if you cry out unto the Lord and cast all your care upon Him and trust in Him and pray to God and praise the Lord, and there's something wonderful that happens. Paul goes on and later teaches in this book that when you cast all your care upon the Lord, you, you know, be careful for nothing but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall cover your hearts and minds. How about that? So next time you got something to complain about, instead of letting it worry you, throw it over to the Lord and let Him exchange your problems for His peace. It's a good trade-off. Praise the Lord on that one. Amen. Let's go with me to chapter number 2, please. Y'all still alive in the Lord this morning? Chapter number 2. Chapter number 2 this morning. What else, what else does it look like to have a life that is dominated by the Lord Jesus? When the Lord Jesus, when your life is all about Him... When your life is literally exists, when your life exists to give Jesus the praise and the glory, when somebody looks at you and says, my goodness gracious, there's something different about you. What is it that's different about you? And, and, and it's the Lord Jesus that's made a difference in your life. And I want to tell you something. That should be getting a, a, a little easier in the world we're living in. We live in such a dark, disturbed world. Say amen with that one right there, right? Listen, that, that as a light bearer, as a light bearer, by just your spirit, your attitude, and the way you respond to things should be quite a bit different the way people live. Amen. Again, we live in a culture that's all about murmuring and complaining. I didn't get my way. I didn't do that in this. And when you're saying, praise the Lord, okay, this is not, not exactly what I want, but God knows what He's doing. And uh, you didn't know what you were doing. You meant it for evil. You tried to do it, but God actually God took what you tried to turn into a burden and God turned it into a blessing. That's the God I serve, so I'm not going to complain. I'm going to trust Him. It's an amazing testimony of light for the God of light. Be a light bearer everywhere you go. Paul said, don't complain. Don't complain. It ruins the testimony. Number four, I want you to notice this morning, and I, I don't think we have, I don't think we got anything on there. That's fine, so that's, that's okay. This is a little bit different. And I want you to think about it this morning because we often think of church as the time when we meet or the place we meet. Church is at 11. I go to Pioneer Baptist Church. And if you're trying to figure out what church to go to, this is the one. Amen? All right? We're, we often think about it that way, but the New Testament is very clear. Church isn't about a time or a location. Church is people. Philippians chapter 2. Y'all with me in the Lord there? Verse number 1. If there be any... Therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill you my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of what? One mind. If your life is dominated by Jesus, you're going to protect relationships within the church. If your life is dominated by Jesus you are going to protect relationships in the church. Why? Well, Jesus died for the church. Amen? Amen? Let's look at some things this morning. Let me pray. Father, we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. Please direct us exactly where we need to go this morning. Father, we, we, we don't want to simply be a group of people who have a location and a time. Father, we want to be what you have designed the church to be. We, we want to be that and nothing more, nothing less. And Father, we know that a church filled with the Spirit of God is the most powerful, most powerful force on this planet because the Spirit of God moves in that kind of church. Lord, help us this morning just to get a little inkling if we can, even just a little bit, a little picture, a little portrait of what it means to protect relationships and how important they are to you most importantly. Lord, help us see how important relationships within the church are to you and help us to live accordingly. We'll praise you. We thank you. We've been blessed already this morning by the music, by the baptism. Lord, we, we see your hand upon us. The big things and the little things. We ate breakfast today. We ate last night. That's better than most people have done in this world. So Lord, we praise you for all things. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. I, I don't have a real zinger for you this morning. This is not going to be blow your mind. and So I'm going to ask you to stay with me on this one. I'm going to ask you to walk with me through this. But we, we, um, we, we've got to understand something. I think you all know this. I won't give you the studies and the statistics. It's just a waste of time. But there's a real big confusion about what it means to be part of a church. 
Some people think to be part of a church means simply to go someplace in a location. You got your little thing checked off and off you went. You never lived the rest of your life. You can go out Monday through Saturday and not have any thought whatsoever about the rest of the people sitting in this building. That's not church. That's not church. I would appreciate a little more agreement on that one. That's not church. Amen. Amen. See, there are at least 59, at least 59, I may have counted short, distinct one another commands in the New Testament. Did you know that? Distinct one another's. Now, if you add all the another and a couple of different things, you could add up well over 100. But if you were to Google the one another commandments uh, uh, in the New Testament, you'd find 59 different commands saying, listen, think about somebody else when it comes to being a Christian. See, the truth of the matter is that church isn't about you. But it is about others. You say, I thought church was about God. I had a little newsflash here. I'm probably going to shoot myself in the foot. Listen, I, I like to go out into the woods. Amen. No cell phone reception, nothing like that. And I like to spend time alone with God there. If I can't do that there, then I just go. I got a little closet that my wife let me have. I go in there, all right? I, mean, I like to spend time with the Lord alone. You can worship the Lord alone, but God has not commanded you to just worship God alone. He has commanded all of us to worship the Lord together as a body with individuals, and God cares about that. He wants us to take personal relationships personally. Do you know the book of Philemon is about one thing, fixing relationships? There is a book in the New Testament called Philemon, right before Hebrews. It's a little bitty one that will tell you how to fix a fractured relationship either in your own life or in somebody else's life. How many of us think we could use that today in our culture? The truth of the matter is we could use it in many churches. Many churches are filled with people with fractured relationships. There is nothing, I'm going to say it, there is nothing more nasty than a church that fights. That's the nastiest thing in the world. It is nasty. Or as they say in the South, nasty. All right, I mean, N-A-S-T-A-Y. All right, it is nasty. When a church fights and they're bickering, and the Bible says, calls it devouring one another, it's not a good thing. And, and boy, my goodness gracious, the Bible gives us so many commands about one another, edify one another, love one another, serve one another. Uh, you go look it up. What I'm trying to tell you is this. Church really isn't, and I hate to say this, I'm glad you're here this morning, it isn't about what's going on right now. I, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you hear the preaching of the Word of God. I'm glad you're sitting next to people that you halfway love and really like. I'm glad about all those things. But the truth of the matter is what really the church does goes on between Monday and Saturday. That's really when, that's really when the church does something. Are you ready for this? For the Lord and for the world. We're, we're not doing anything. And I, again, I, there ain't nobody who loves going to church more than I do. All right, You might love it as much as I do, but not more than I do. I love it. All right, I love being here. I love, I've always loved being in God's house. But we're not doing anything for the lost and dying world right now, right here. We're edifying ourselves. We're glorifying the Lord. We're getting ourselves pumped up in the Lord, so to speak, so we can go out and do something as a church. Amen. Amen. We've gathered together. We've assembled in so that we can go out and do what the church is supposed to do. Now, while we think about evangelism and we think about reaching the world, we have to do that, but the Bible's very clear. A church cannot reach its community if it cannot live in community with each other. Yeah. Give me an amen on that one right there. How can you fight Satan if you're fighting one another? Wow. For many professing Christians today, church is little more than a relationship that is about as deep as you have at the gym. Hey, how you doing? Good. Now, we did this a couple weeks ago. We're going to do it often. We, we put num name tags on. How many were here for name tag service? All right. Oh, good. All right. I want you to name everybody you met. Uh, we, we, we need to do this. And that's one of the reasons why we're moving to these demographic Sunday schools so that we can get and have a, quite a bit more relationship than what we've got going on right now. But I want you to understand something that we are not supposed to be a random group of people who kind of know somebody's face. And when you see them at Walmart, you're like, hey, good to see you, brother, sister. What is their name? I do not know. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Y'all be honest. How many of you have seen somebody from this church, you've seen them out and about, you didn't know their name, but you waved at him and said, hey, how you doing? All right. The rest of you, line, line, line. All right. It, it, yeah, that happens. You see, I, what the Lord wants us to do is have a personal relationship with each other. Yeah. The Lord wants us to protect our relationships with each other. What a far cry from the early church's interaction in Acts chapter 2. We won't go there for sake of time. Where it says they continued steadfastly and they were daily together, breaking bread. They were in fellowship. They were sitting under the apostles' doctrine. They were getting preaching. They were getting fellowship. 
They were eating together. By the way, that's one of the, you know, if you look up the acrostic Baptist, letter B stands for buffet. All right, I mean, all right. Buffet at, I mean, but the truth of the matter is it's one of the hallmarks of a New Testament church is, yes, a, a world desire to reach the gospel, but also a personal relationship with each other. And please don't say this church is too big. The early church had well over 5,000 people in it. They had plenty of fellowship with each other. Don't say that. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God wants you to take personal relationships personally. So personal, in fact, man, time. Go, just go to Galatians. That's okay. Galatians. I might finish this tonight. I think it's so important. Galatians, please. How personal does God want you involved with other church members? Before you answer that out loud, I mean, does it want to be like, hey, how you doing? Great. And what was your kid's name again? By the way, we're still doing that. Don't, don't be upset if you can't remember all the kids' names. I just start, I start naming off, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Good, good. Hi, sleepy, dopey. I mean, I just do whatever I could do. I, I mean, I don't, there's a bunch of kids I've been calling by the wrong name for a year. They're now answering to it. I, that's good, okay? Uh, Oh, isn't he sweet? Uh, but uh, anyway, how, how personal does God want you involved in other church members' lives? I want you to think about this for a minute. I'm telling you, this is not a wowie zowie message. But see, we, we live in a church culture today. Where this is what people want. What people want is be able to slide in, <coughs> slide out. Nobody ever saw you. Nobody cares if you're not there. You don't have to be involved in service because they got professionals doing all of it. Huh? Yep. You come in, put your, put your bottom in the pew, put a dollar in the plate, go on your way. Everybody has a merry time for the rest of the next six days. You do it again all over on Sunday. And we had church. That's not church. Amen. That's not church. I asked somebody recently who went to one of those type of churches, I said, let me ask you, when you get sick, who's going to call you? Yeah. Well, I said, okay. Who would you call right now if you had a problem? Well, you, know, you say, well, this is all about size. No, it's not. My wife went, grew up in a rather large church. They had personal relationships. So I'm not, I'm not even going to get about size. And that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is it doesn't matter how big you are as long as every individual person takes personal relationships personally. Yeah. Yeah. Galatians chapter 6. How, how personal does God want you? With your other brothers and sisters. Galatians chapter 6. Brethren. Who's that talking to? All Christians, right? Brethren. Brethren and sistren. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual should put it on Facebook. <laughs> Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual should turn your back on this person. Act like you can't touch him because somehow sin jumps from one person to the other like chicken pox. Hello? That's what happens in churches. I'm sick of it. God hates it, by the way. God hates that. God hates that business. There is a time for reproof. There is a time for all these kinds of things. But the whole point of dealing with issues is not to exclude a person, but get them right with God and get them back in the fellowship of the church. Amen. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Let me just pause right here. Now, this is as far as I'm going to get today. I'm sorry, but this is where we're going to stop right here. What the Bible says, if you're a spiritual person, means you are inclined in spiritual things. You're walking in the Lord. You, are, you care about so much about somebody that if they get overtaken in a fault, you don't kick them when they're down. You run to them and you say, hey, how can I help you get right with God? Amen. One of my favorite phrases, many of you know it around here is, I ask this people all the time, What's the next right step? What's the next right thing we can do? I've, I've had people sit in my office and they say, look, I've got this and I've got this and this situation. Or I've talked to people on the phone. This situation is just out of absolute control. And this, th th over here, there was no solution. And I went over here, there was no solution. What do I do? And I said, well, well just what's the next right thing you can do? Because I want to help you start making right decisions, not sit there and let you waller in a bad one. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to repeat them. Somebody say Amen. But listen, we, we, if you're spiritual, if you're spiritual, you are so 
involved. You care about so much so when somebody falls that it actually hurts you. Amen. How many of your parents? I have, I have a, a little philosophy. You might think it's barbaric, but it's not. I don't run to my children when they cry. I never have. And I never will. Now, I mean, I just said that, and I'm going to run out there when my, my daughter falls because you know, she's a little different. <laughs> Boys should be one callus from head to toe. Girls a little different, okay? But listen, I, I, I don't run to my children when they cry. Well, you say, that's barbaric. No, it's not. There's different, it's amazing how when you don't do that, they walk, get up and walk to you, right? But it, uh, here's the point, though. I, I do want to. I do want to run to them. I want to run to them. Oh, what happened? Looks so bad. Make daddy kiss you, boop. My daughter's like, Dad, I'm Tim. Please stop this, you know. I try to carry her into school like she's a little girl, you know, a little baby. She won't let me do it. I mean, listen, that's our natural inclination of love to run to our children when they're really hurt. And as a church, the real natural inclination, if your life is dominated by Jesus, you will run to people when they're hurt because that's what Jesus did. Amen. Jesus ran to us. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. God wants you so involved in each other's lives personally, not that when somebody falls you gossip about it because that ain't love. You don't Facebook about it because that's not love. You don't have a fake prayer meeting with somebody else about them because that's not love. We need to really pray for sister and so-and-so about what? Oh, you didn't hear? <laughs> well, evidently the Lord has made you the evangelist of bad news and so you've got to go and tell somebody else whatever happened to somebody else and that's your ministry of evangelism right there is talking about all the bad stuff that has happened. That is not what God has called us to do. Amen. God has called us to restore people, to bring them back. Sometimes that involves reproof. It always does. Reproof, you were wrong. This is wrong. Rebuke, you were wrong to do it. But let me exhort you into righteousness. Here's how you get it right. Somebody say amen. amen. Say, I, here's what I hope this week, and, and I'm going to close. Are we still good? Are everybody okay right now? Here's what I hope this week. I, I, I hope to the Lord. I hope to the Lord that I stay faithful to my Savior, to my wife, to my children, to my calling for the rest of my days. I hope to God I do. I, better men than me have not. May, way better men. But I want to tell you something. If I take a biff tomorrow, I really hope, I really hope what you do is come to me and say, Preacher, I'm sorry. This has happened. How can I help you pick up the pieces? Amen. Now let me spread your ashes all over for everybody else to see. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to close with this. I don't have time to get any... Well, I'm not. I'm, I just fibbed. I'm not closing right now. I'm going to speak until I get done speaking because that's where I am right now. Many years ago, a very famous preacher, I disagreed with a lot of doctrine, a lot of philosophy, a lot of things. Some of you would know him back in the East. Committed an egregious act and was well-known, nationalized. And it was amazing to me the amount of know-it-alls that came out of the woodwork to put him down. Never thinking about his family. Never thinking about even though what he did was wicked and sinful, he still was a soul that God died for. Amen. And the spiritual people didn't come out to restore. They came out to throw arrows. That was amazing to me. I lost a lot of respect. for. I quit reading a lot of men's books when I saw some of the responses. I said, I'm not going to do that. Well, the brother, you can't help me. Because I might be produced in our church, and I'm not going down that route. So God wants you so personally involved in each other's lives that when somebody gets hurt, yeah, it might be shocking. When somebody sins, it might be, oh, man, oh, are you serious? I've done a couple of those. What were you thinking? How stupid can you be? Yeah, you see, you shouldn't have said that. I know, but I did. But my heart was broken. My heart was broken. See, that's what church is about. You being in a place where you can help somebody if they're hurt. Yeah. And if you're hurt, but somebody can help you. Yeah. That's what the Bible says. Galatians chapter 6, you're still there. Bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Amen. Did you read that? Bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. See, we're too busy today. We can't, we're, it's all about us. Well, we're, I, I got this going on in my life, and I got to make this visit over here, and I got to do this, and I got to do that, and I got all these things. I'd love to help out, preacher, but I ain't got time for it. Well, I'm going to say that's not the right attitude. You bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. 
This is what it means to be involved in the personal relationships of people. See, it's gross sometimes and icky and uncomfortable, but it's also joyful. I love being able to go to church members, people, when they call me and they had little babies. Several of you, I've got, I've got to be the first one to hold, uh, besides y'all and the nurse, uh, I got to be like, you know, fifth on the line. I got to hold a baby. I was the first, got to hold mine because I delivered him. All right, but I, I, you know, that's a joyful thing. It's a joyful thing to be able to be a part of God's people when they're getting married. It's, it's good to be there. See, when you get involved in people's personal lives, you get the joys and the downs. The ups and the blessings. You get to pray for people when they're hurt, and you get to praise God when people get blessed. You're personally involved in people's lives. I, I'm going to finish this message. I may finish it tonight. I may finish it next week. I have no earthly idea, so just come back for both. Amen. Amen. But I want to tell you something, that this is not a gym membership. As a pastor, in the way that I'm geared, our church, and the way God wants it, is being one of those churches that's all up in your business. Yes? I don't, I, I'm not a personal space person. Like, right now, I'm too close to Brother Jacob. That's the way most of you feel. Uh, no, just kidding, all right? But I, I'm not a person. You got that joke. I'm not a personal space person. I, somebody gets right here, I start getting uncomfortable. You know, I go to the dentist. This committee is my dentist, right? First time I went in there, she was like, here. I was like, you know, I don't, I've got a personal space bubble. I don't like that. But God has called you as a believer to be involved in other people's personal space bubble. Yep. You're hurting? See, let me help you. You ought to be able to read brothers and sisters. You okay today? Yeah. Something's different. Something's wrong here. Because I know what it's like for many of you to put a smile on your face, but I, I heard what happened last week. I know you're hurting inside. And I, I'll tell you this, and, and I'm, I really am done. I don't want to be, but I'm done. You, I'm going to say, you're going to, this is going to hurt my pastor, somebody might say this, but you need more than me in this church. You need more than me. I love to pray for you, but I'm not the only one that can pray for you. You need more than me. You don't just need to have a relationship with the preacher and with the Lord. God says, ye which are spiritual, restore one another. By the way, that's ye, plural, one another, singular, personal. Now, we'll give several things, maybe tonight, maybe next Sunday, what it means to protect those relationships. Do we understand there's a real difference between church marketing culture and biblical New Testament church? Everybody with me on this one this morning? I'm not okay with us not knowing what's going on in each other's lives. I'm not good with that because God's not good with it. Protect relationships. Now, I don't know how to give an invitation on this. I think we could all say we could be better involved in each other's lives. Amen? So how would I balance this between raising my children and being married and working and all that kind of stuff? Let God handle that. Commit that way unto the Lord. Trust also unto Him and He shall bring it to pass. If you say, Lord, I want to be one of these personally you know, not a busybody, not a tail bearer, but I want to be involved in my brothers and sisters' lives like we do with any family. Will you help me? God will help you. God will help you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We're closing now this morning. Not going to blow your mind today, but this is as helpful as we can be as a church. This, 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 if you want to see revival in our church, and God is doing some amazing things, but God can outpour His Spirit with the people who protect the relationships within the body. You hear this morning and say, I, as part of the body, speaking of, I have the testimony of being saved and born again. I know Christ as my Lord and Savior. If I died today, I know it's okay. I've been placed in the body. I'm one of the Lord Jesus's. I'm a child of God. I'm, I'm His without a shadow of a doubt. Would you raise your hand this morning? You know without a shadow of a doubt this morning. Praise the Lord for you this morning. Thank you. You can put those hands down. Anybody here this morning say, I, I couldn't give that testimony. No one's looking. No one's looking. I'm looking. You hear this morning say, I could not give that testimony as I'm a child of God. If I died today, I would go to heaven. I do not know that for sure. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. No one will be looking. I'll be looking. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. You say, Pastor, that's me. I, I don't know. Are you going to call me out? I'm not going to call you out. 
I'll let you deal with, move forward as you see wish with this decision. But you say, I'm here this morning, Pastor. You need to pray for me. I'm, I'm unsaved. I don't know if I'm saved. That's my testimony today. Will anybody raise your hand? I'm not looking around. Any, are you no one's looking around? Anybody this morning? Anybody in the church this morning needs to be saved? You're not saved. Anybody? Do you know that you know? 100%. So I don't know that. Would you raise your hand? I do not know 100%. By testimony then, everybody in this room is a Christian. You're a member of the body of Christ and hopefully you're a member of this body. How many of us could do a better job of taking the command and the desire of God to be more concerned about the personal relationships of the church? We see how important it is to the Lord. It needs to be as important to us. How many of us just need some help in this area? Can I pray for you? Would you raise your hand this, this morning? Just need to pray for you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Let's all stand where we are. We'll let the instruments begin playing. If you can stand, you stand.